Hello everyone, my name is Nathan Huseman. I'm a curatorial assistant for learning and studio projects at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Welcome to the AGO Let's Play. This is a new series where we look at intersections between art history, game arts, and design. Today, we're looking at a one-of-a-kind game, Hatoful Boyfriend. Hatoful Boyfriend is developed by Mediatonic, Hato Moa, and the Irregular Corporation. It's published by Devolver Digital. Originally released in 2011, we're playing the 2014 version on Steam. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that while we're meeting in a digital space today, the Art Gallery of Ontario operates on land that is territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and was also the territory of the Wendat and Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, I am joined by Sarah Britton. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Well, Sarah is an experienced designer, video game creator, and an art historian, and is the holder of many more titles and accolades. Sarah, welcome to AGO Let's Play. I gave you a brief introduction, but can you tell our audience, our listeners, a little bit more about yourself and your background? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's such a privilege to, to be participating in this incredible program. Uh, my name is Sarah Bryn. I am based in London. I'm originally from Southern California. Uh, and in a nutshell, the way I describe the work that I do is finding new vehicles for people to do creative things. And often that works with involves working with uh, different types of technologies, including video games like we'll chat about today, uh, as well as things like 3D printing, uh, laser cutting, CNC milling, et cetera. Um, and one of my priorities when for the work that I do is making sure that we are moving towards more equitable arts economies and relationships between um, cultural institutions and people who make creative things. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, for this episode, you selected Hatoful Boyfriend. Can you tell us why you selected this game and, and what the experience of players is when they play the game? Yeah. I'm going to bring the game up on stream right for us right for us right here. Perfect. Right. So, so when y'all reached out to me and said, oh, would you be interested in doing kind of a let's play sort of walkthrough and conversation, I was like, hold on a second. I don't know if I can play a video game and have any kind of meaningful conversation at the same time. Um, and because, you know, I think a lot of the time when we think about video games, we're using maybe a dual stick controller and we have to think about, you know, dexterity and competition and a time limit. So I was really stressed out and I was really grateful um, that when I suggested the possibility that we do a text based game, uh, that y'all were, were not only open to it, but enthusiastic. And so um, text-based games are really interesting because usually they are non-competitive. Usually there's not a, um, a time limit and uh, you usually can't lose. And also the kind of primary skill involved in playing the game um, is reading and writing, something that I've been lucky enough to have been doing for most of my life and feel very confident doing it. <laughs> Uh, but part of what's really exciting about uh, Hatoful Boyfriend specifically is that I wanted to show people that um, video games are, are really effective mechanisms for storytelling and they can get really, really weird. And so <laughs> what this game is, it is in very short to uh, simplify, it is a pigeon dating simulator. Yes, that's right. Uh, as you can see from the image here on screen, we have a bunch of lovely pigeons sort of on display. Um, do we want to dive in and, let, and get started playing this game and sort of showing yeah. people what's up with it? All right. Let's do I'm it. I'm going to start a new game here. St. Pidgeo Nations Institute. Please enter your name. All right. What should our name be as we play this game? Oh, it's auto-populating as Hayoko. Yes. Um, what do you think? Should we, should we keep that? Yeah, let's keep let's just keep it simple. Let's 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 play it as here. Okay. And Tosaka as our last name. This is uh, yes. <laughs> All right. Is Hiyoko Tosaka okay? The game asks. Yes. Yes, it is. We're gonna say. All right. So it's asking us if we would like 
our birds to appear as humans when first introduced. Now, I, I think we should go full bird mode. Is that how you feel as well? 100%. I don't get to be a bird every day. Perfect. Yeah, it's not every day you get to play a bird dating simulator, so we want to go all in <laughs> on our bird experience. Okay. St. Pigeonations, a school blessed with extensive curricula and facilities. It's already been a year since I ended my extraordinary life and walked through these gates. All right, so we're entering the game. Um, in looks like in the story, we've already been to this school of birds before. Um, and we are a human sort of going attending this, mm -hmm. this school for birds. Um, what can you sort of tell us about the early parts of the story as we sort of play through this here? Well, we're, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're setting this, this stage. And, and so we're, we're kind of setting the context of the world, uh, which I think is really important anytime you kind of do a, a, a storytelling game, but in order for us to, we're going to be asked to make a series of choices as we kind of navigate uh, this environment and choose different branching storylines. And so this is the kind of giving us the primer that we need in order to make thoughtful or exploratory uh, decisions, especially there's going to be a lot of characters who are introduced to us. So right now we're kind of getting some of the, the preliminary introductions to uh, some of some of the characters. So uh, it looks like we've had breakfast. Oh, no, we're running late. I'm uh, late on our first day of class. School. This is very stressful. It's a high stakes situation. But our best um, friend Ryuta, who is a pigeon, is sort of helping us out, it looks like right now. Thank goodness. And like, as you can see already, like it's it's not like I'm being asked to like jump or leap or anything like that. I'm just starting school, which is which is great. So this Some, is oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh no. This is part of a, a, a genre, or however you might define it, of sort of dating simulators. Can you tell? Can you tell us sort of how you sort of quote unquote win or lose at dating simulators, or can you even win or lose, or, or what does that even look like with yeah. a dating simulator? Yeah, can you game? even win or lose with dating? That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think the answer is yes, <laughs> uh, but, the, but the stakes are a little different. Um, so you know, whereas in a traditional game like Mario, you'll die and then you'll ha you'll respawn, right? Whereas in a game like this, it's it's more like relationships don't work out. You have an opportunity to start over. You uh, pursue different pigeons, um, and basically, we we it's for me the objective here is more about uncovering different stories. And as long as you play, that's what you're doing. And there's sort of like, you mentioned sort of that you make choices and, and you kind of arrive at crossroads in the dialogue and then mm -hmm. you would sort of choose different options and that would create branching paths and branching storylines. And there's, so there's sort of alternate endings or there's alternate, you know, ways that you can, you can complete the game. Is that right? That's, that's right. Um, and this is actually really interesting because if you think about, you know, traditional story structure, like the, the hero's journey or the Freytag pyramid, uh, those stories are really linear, right? Um, but when you think about from a writing or a creative process, like how do you write a nonlinear story? That's like a whole different structure and really interesting. So if you were kind of to map it out, I think it would more, more look like a cluster of nodes in terms of characters and points of intersection um, and maybe kind of some interspersed plot points, but it's not nowhere near as, as like, you know, we have the crescendo and the denouement and uh, it's, it's a little bit more distributed, which is exciting and difficult. That's right. Now, as part of the visual style, um, what we sort of see, as you can sort of see what's on, on screen right now, is you have these images of these photorealistic birds sort of uh, shown in, in context with, uh, with drawn backgrounds, where they look like almost like sort of anime style backgrounds. What effect does that have on us as the player? Sort of what, you know, what do you think, how do you take that aesthetic in? Yeah, I mean, I think that different aesthetics land with different people in different ways, obviously. So uh, my association with this kind of art style is very much like kind of like manga, Japanese storytelling, a little bit fantastical. So it's not, I don't feel like, this is like gritty and grungy. I feel like it's a little bit fantastical and, and romantic. 
Um, and this is actually from a style of, of games and media making in Japan called Otome, and I might be pronouncing that wrong, which means it, it, it's storytelling for, for girls and, and women. Um, of course, you know, everyone can enjoy uh, or should be allowed to enjoy any type of, type of media content. But what this would mean is that that kind of theme of love and romance is going to be a little bit more present and visible here. And I think that's being manifested in the aesthetics aesthetic style. And what do you think, what do you make of the choice to sort of choose pigeons as the bird? I, I know there's often associations with pigeons being a bit more of a mundane animal, you know, sometimes they're considered a nuisance, or in other cases, they've been, you know, a, util a utilitarian part of society, if you think about, you know, carrier pigeons, or, mm -hmm. or that type of thing. Yeah, what do you what do you make of the choice of pigeons? Well, pigeons, you know, usually are quite abundant. Uh, which is great. And so I think, you know, abundance and dating are two things you kind of like to have together. Normally, you want to have a lot of different options. Also, when I think of pigeons, they strike me as particularly urban, right? So like, they're going to be hanging out in a city square, just like perhaps like, you know, you might see a bunch of teens outside of Harajuku Station. Uh, you'd also see a bunch of pigeons outside of Harajuku Station. Um, so and, th and they're also quite social. So, so this is, you know, it, it makes sense that these are kind of like everyday social birds, but also each one's going to be a little bit different. That's right. It also, what I find is that it sort of, it makes you reconsider this idea of sort of, of, of you know, of romance or this idea of, of trying to get a date when you're looking at sort of like a creature or something, you know, which which you wouldn't normally associate with, with dating, you sort of start to think about the dialogue and, and other aspects of a person. How, how do you sort of take that in? I, I think that's, that's really cool and a really good point. And also, you know, it's, it's, we, we don't sexualize a vision in the same ways, right? So like, you know, I can't take umbrage that the particular visual representation of a pigeon is is like oh that's that pigeon is too sexy that pigeon is not dressed appropriately for the workplace um you know and i i, I think that's that's really great and that's really clever and like by kind of working with the pigeon body instead of a human body we can kind of go straight into the interpersonal or interpigeon dynamics that's right. It sort of becomes all about the, the dialogue and the conversation and sort of the actions of the pigeons and less about, you know, their appearance or or those types of things or even even their like their gender. The, the, the pigeons gender is not often addressed um, in, the, yeah. in the game. So. So we are still in class and they're looking for our best friend who had helped us out, but he was going to the infirmary. Oh, no. Now. Yes, it looks like he has a, a weak stomach. We're going to make oh, sure he's no. okay. By, so now we're, we're in the infirmary here. Now, this game, sort of the, the story kind of moves forward, but every, every once in a while, um, it drops in little mysteries or little things that, that seem odd that wouldn't normally happen in a school. So, for example, right now, we went to go look for our friend, but nobody's there. And then, you know, on screen, we can sort of see there are some things in the background. There are some jars and some things kind of hidden in the artwork that, that might be alluding to something later. Um, because it's a game that allows for multiple playthroughs, there's sort of a bunch of different ways to, to take in the information. Um, when you played this game, did you get a chance to explore some of those different avenues? And mm -hmm. what did you find? Um, well, you know, of course I found a bunch of different uh, personality types. And as you mentioned, those kind of more eerie scenes. Um, but uh, yeah, I also noticed that there's there's a little bit uh, of a, a subtext there about the kind of world and the world that they've built. And I don't know if we want to talk more about that now or later in the conversation. Or... We'll get to that a little bit okay, later, yes. Great. And we can awesome. see, so here's the, here's the, the, uh, the doctor pigeon presented to us. We can see this image, you know, that he looks a little bit more menacing. So he says he's going to feed you all sorts of things if you want. Hmm? So I don't know about, about this doctor pigeon no, here. No, no, <laughs> not allowed at school. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you can see sort of um, in that sort of anime style, they have those sort of big headers as they introduce characters, giving us their names. Um, and this is a partridge in this case, the school doctor here. He's rather creepy in person, it says, and has a bad reputation amongst the student body. Um, another cute thing that they do. So instead of everybody, you can see in the text, it says every birdie. So just mm -hmm. fun little adjustments to, um, to what we're seeing in the language here. He's wondering why we're here and he... Uh, yes, 
our, our best friend still seems to be missing here. Can you tell us about some of the other sort of dating simulator games that might be out there in the world and sort of in contrast to this one? What is what does that yeah. whole sort of scene look like? I mean, my, my uh, preference is always going to be a little bit outside of the the mainstream uh, kind of dating simulator where you know it's it's hetero um, and so there's there's a there's a simulator that I also really like called Dream Daddy and uh, it's a dating simulator for daddies and you have uh, and I love that because you know kind of like the idea of representing the players as or, or the characters as pigeons it's an opportunity to just God, like heteronormative love and romance is so boring. <laughs> We've seen those stories before. Um, and uh, exploring different types of love and different types of relationships is really cool. And I think that seeing that in games is really exciting because it can go both ways. It can show people that games can be an opportunity to like explore and tell different types of stories. But at the same time, I think like, it, in some ways, it's a it's a form of representation, and to let people who you know might not be into that hetero dating scene to know, be like, actually, other worlds are possible. Like, we other types of relationships are possible. Other kinds of love are possible. Um, and I think I think that's so great. But you, there are so many scholars who know so much more about this who have written extensively about. Um, characters and um and love and romance including my friend now doctor uh jolene blom who just got her phd from itu copenhagen so you might want to look up her scholarship if you're curious to learn more about mm -hmm. um characters and love and relationship in, in games thank you and and so dating simulators sort of when when did we start to see some of the earliest versions of the games or or do we know i know this game is was originally out in 2011 and we're playing the 2014 version but dating simulators haven't been around for a, for a super long time. Do right. we know a little bit about kind of when they came, when they emerged? You know, so what I what I can tell you is that I thinking about earlier video game history, um, some of the most earliest the earliest video games uh, kind of came up in tandem with the kind of development of the military industrial complex. So if you look at Space War, you know uh, that's that's kind of what co developed by by DARPA in the United States and kind of uh, coinciding with the kind of development of earlier computing. Then we have kind of move on to arcade games, as you know, notably things like Pac-Man. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I meant Space War was that earlier game, not Space mm. Invaders, because Space Invaders is an arcade game that came later. Um, and so, um, yeah, and again, you can't, if you're in an arcade, you're not going to be as likely to play something like a dating simulator because arcade interactions need those quarters, right, or those coins. So you're going to keep those interactions short. And also there's going to be a difficulty spike because you don't want people hanging out on the same machines all day using the same quarter. The thing about um, uh, uh, doujin games or, or kind of like uh, indie games uh, is that they started to pop up as soon as the tools for computing and game making uh, became a little bit more accessible and you could have gameplay experiences on your own devices at home. Uh, I would not be able to tell you the specific years that uh, dating simulators start to really come into the, the foreground, but I do know that, that Dojin games are part of a subculture that is in many ways close to fan culture, this idea of kind of making games inspired by other types of media content. Sometimes you can't even sell them because they are use infringing upon other folks' IP, but there's usually kind of like this homebrew vibe to them, which I think is really cool and really special, which is part of why we start to get really unique games like Hatopo Boyfriend. One of the one of the aspects of the game's marketing that I that I saw is that they say that they use copyright free images of pigeons. They try and use that as a selling point, and that the pigeons are in glorious 1080p resolution. So <laughs> you can see that the sort of the the silliness or the quirkiness of the game does sort of spill out into the way it's presented into the world. In terms of the gameplay, I've paused us here because we have a choice to make. So we can join the student council, the track team, or the library staff. Now, uh, which one do you think we should go down? Got to do library staff. Library staff, okay. <laughs> We're going down this route. 
Let's see where that takes us. All right. Oh, it's an elective day today. So we get Great. to choose, make some more choices here. And, and you can see we kind of have some stats now. It looks like WIS, VIT, and CHA. So if I know my Dungeons and Dragons or my mm. gaming, it should be Wisdom, Vitality, and Charisma. So um, let's see. Should we attend math class, gym class, or music class? Well, in real life, I would never attempt gym, gym class. So let's 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 take the fantastical route. <laughs> All right. But wait. So do you let's should we take the gym class? Then? Yeah. Let's, okay. Yeah. Let's let's see what we might have missed by avoiding our gym classes yeah. in our real school lives. Okay. <laughs> ah, yes. But because we were human, we had to sit out of the wing training. But it was fun anyway. Maybe one day we'll be able to fly too. So the game does make some coy references to sort of the player being human um, mm -hmm. and the bird and you know the 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 rest of the characters being birds. Um, and although it doesn't address that head on initially, um, it. it we does get more into that as as the game progressed. So even though we didn't participate, we still get more vitality points. We leveled okay. up, our vitality went up by five. So that's our, that's good news. Our wisdom's still real low. Yes, <laughs> we aren't very wise, um, perhaps to what's going on here. Maybe that's a reflection. Uh, yes, the the library appears to be boring. Doesn't seem very popular. Not enough books. Uh, at least the view is nice. Okay. You'd think that would boost our wisdom, spending all think, time in the library. the library, yes. There's no birdie here, as we say. Oh, interesting. Oh. So yes, you you can see, as we sort of alluded to, there's little little hints of of sort of perhaps darkness or or something like that sort of dropped throughout, and and in the dialogue here, you know, little musings about jumping off uh, the top of the building, for example, um, kind of hinted that. Yikes. All right. Oh, this bird was hiding. He's almost as bad as the doctor. It's you don't like the doctor. No, the doctor's kind no. of. Oh. Um, I do wow. want to sort of. Oh yes, is that a problem? What's well, right? It's a pretty pugnacious pigeon. Yes. You should go outside, or books are nice. Well, we've been in the library for a while. Not a lot has happened. Even though I really want to boost our wisdom, it seems like we're being prompted to go outside. I think maybe we should go outside. Okay, let's go outside here. He looks angry. I think I just tripped a landmine. Uh-oh. Oh. It's too sunny, he says. He doesn't like the sun. Okay, well maybe oh. maybe we're not impressing this particular pigeon in terms of our of our dating simulator. I don't know if things are, are going well. Um, I did want to take this moment actually to pivot a little bit to show off uh, some of the art that's in the AGO collection. And I'm just bringing it up on stream right now. So the artifact uh, on the right here, this is an image of a mirback. So it's a it's an ivory mirback. It's French. It's from Paris in the Middle Ages, sort of the, the 1300s, sort of in, in that range. And on the back of the mirror here, it, it has depictions of courtship. So essentially, the people in these images are on a date, really. And objects like this mirror, um, this sort of Gothic ivory mirror, these would be used as sort of courtship objects you'd sort of give them to to express you know give them to the person you're pursuing to to express your interest objects like you know mirrors or combs uh, that sort of thing would would be used in this way uh, in in the medieval period um, but mostly for for very sort of privileged folks we're talking about royalty we're talking about those types of things um, Sarah what jumps out at you when you sort of see this this mirror back here well perhaps I would pose this question to you and I would say, is this date going well? <laughs> oh, yes. So you've got like these these quadrants and there's a few different gestures, but I, you know, what looks like the, the top right quadrant to me where one of them is like, oh, come here. Another one's like, mm, I'm good. I like slow your old buddy. <laughs> Yeah, in each of the in each of the quadrants, sort of the 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 male figure that's presented seems to be trying sort of different approaches or trying perhaps like the game, you know, trying to take different paths towards you know this 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 person. And yeah, although the the female presenting person doesn't seem to be, you know, th their posture sort of stays the same throughout the four mm -hmm. quadrants. So it's um perhaps they're not receiving that very well, or or it's you know. Just like that, our pigeon didn't want to go outside. This person might not be liking what's what's being exchanged here. Yeah, um, and I've got a question. And so you know, might notice that each of the four corners is adorned with what appears to be some kind of creature. Do we know what that is? 
uh, our our art historians on our side couldn't you know didn't didn't mention to us what what that animal might be. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely interesting. Um, we know that sort of from this time period, uh, birds and animals were often sort of associated with that uh, pastoral sort of yeah. feeling about getting out of the city and getting into the country. And in the medieval ages, privacy was not like it is today. So, I mean, the ability to go on dates, you, you think about a date as a somewhat sort of private thing, you know, either having dinner privately or, or getting to talk to someone one on one. Mm -hmm. And in medieval cities, that was not very possible. So often it involved going out to the country or going, getting out of the city. Um, sometimes they would even go hawking in which they would, you know, go hunting with a bird um, in order to essentially go on these dates. So that could be an indicator to sort of that, that we're, we're, you know, we're not in a city. We're in a, a wild or more romantic location. Definitely. And, you know, I think I think that's a very cool option for a date, right? Like, you know, so do you want to go, you know, mess around with a falcon i think that's that's or a hawk i think that's that's super cool um but at the same time if i was on a date and someone was like oh here's the mirror i'd be like what are you trying to say <laughs> <laughs> that's um, right it's kind of like when someone gives you gum on a date you know it, it's like right right and so and like and thinking about like those little critters in the corners like they're almost are like some kind of gremlin or or gargoyle like I don't think they're deliberately portrayed to be like cute or beautiful so I don't know perhaps harkening to a darker side or a more animalistic side um, of, of this kind of courtship process yes that's right and I'm glad that you brought up that darker side throughout our conversation we've kind of been hinting um, that Hatoful boyfriend in some ways isn't isn't what it seems um, they're just like a, a mirror sort of can show you your reflection, there's also a reflection to this game. Um, and we I don't want to spoil it too much, but there's a certain path that you can take um, with some of the sort of the darker things that we've been seeing. And it actually, the type of game that we encounter actually changes. The title of the game changes. Um, and amongst the game's community, it's a sort of a, 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 there's a delightful twist that occurs. I do want to keep some of the mystery, so I don't want to um, go, delve into that too deeply. but you know, being a little vague, or if we can keep the mystery, what, what, what did you encounter as you sort of played this game and analyzed this game a little bit? Well, you can tell that there's some kind of um, catastrophic event that has occurred that is related to uh, this kind of strange situation with the ubiquity of the pigeons and the kind of personification of the pigeons. And, um, you know, this kind of feeling of being a human amongst all pigeons might kind of give the possibility that maybe there aren't a lot of humans around. Um, and instead we have this kind of strange hybrid of uh, personified pigeons. Uh, but yeah, maybe that feeling of isolation and that feeling of uh, catastrophe and also thinking about the role of the institution post-catastrophe, right? Like the school, which is kind of a very kind of uh, a locus for tradition and protocol and how things get done. Like the fact that the institution is not being controlled by humans, but instead that these kind of pigeons um, is also quite telling. That's right. And uh, on screen right now, we can see that our player character um, saying, ah, sitting at home is so relaxing. And yet our home seems to be a cave. So, you know, another illusion that something is perhaps, you know, not quite uh, as it seems. Why would we be living in a cave? You know, it's, a, it's an interesting it's an interesting question. Um, and I think the feeling go. of feeling like an outsider at school is a very common trope. But this is a really different type of feeling like an outsider. That's right. So here we're given a choice of who to talk to. Um, which character do you think we should have a conversation with? Gosh, maybe Kazuaki? All right, let's go. Oh, break isn't over yet. They wanted to talk to oh. you. Your friends are all here. Why not talk with them? Oh, they uh -oh. seem a little bit resistant to talking a to loop. us. Oh, but perhaps there's something... Oh, they're being very sort of coy oh. in their language with us. This is this is looking better. Yes. Um, I don't know oh. about you, but sometimes sometimes my dates can feel a little bit awkward too, or there can be some awkward dialogue sometimes oh. in, in in dating. So this is uh, often you know reflective <laughs> of perhaps how uh, how approaching someone what you know might might actually go 
in, in more real life. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I did want to sort of ask you um, if anyone's sort of interested in following in your footsteps or kind of accomplishing some of the same things that you've accomplished in your career, in your life, um, what kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, what I would say is that kind of feeling of feeling like an outsider in school or in institutions uh, as represented in this game is a familiar feeling for me. And that I would say if there, if you yourself are feeling a calling to reject or push against some of the structures or systems that you are living in in your daily life, whether that's the kind of standards of academia or uh, the kind of traditional narratives you're seeing in media or in your life around you um, or the popularity of a specific type of aesthetic um, and you're feeling a little tension there, I would say that see see what happens if you push against that and see what happens if you ask, well, actually, does this is this the way things have to be? And I would say if you're dreaming of a different world, then um, it's worth it to try and go after it. And the good news is, is that, you know, sometimes we feel, uh, alone in our dreams or embarrassed by our dreams or ashamed of the things that we want or things that we think we need. But the, the thing is, is that, uh, chances are lots of other people are going to feel those yearnings too, as well as a similar type of shame. So if you can find a way to kind of circumnavigate or push back or speak up despite all of those things and say, hey, um, wouldn't it be cool if, or something I've been really needing is this, um, chances are you'll be in good company. So that that's that's my recommendation. Listen, listen to in here if you can. I know it can be hard and everyone has different barriers and challenges in their life but um that this is this is the right person to be uh honest and loyal to yes that that idea of you know being yourself even if it means being a bit of an outlaw um, compared mm -hmm. to what's around you um great i would encourage all of our viewers to to give this game a chance even if a pigeon dating simulator doesn't really sound like your thing i would definitely recommend um checking this game out um, also, come to the AGO and check out our medieval art. We have some absurd art, which is also kind of in line of, with some of the absurd things happening uh, in this game as well. Um, and that's going to take us to the end of our time. Thank you so much, Sarah, for taking the time to speak with us and sharing your expertise. If you would like to hear more from Sarah Brin, you can follow her on Twitter at Dinosaur R Party, which is D-I-N-O-S-A-U-R-R-P-A-R-T-Y. You can also uh, find them at uh, sarahbrin.com, which is their website. And if you want to hear more about what the AGO is up to, including our medieval art, our absurd art, all of that wonderful stuff, you can find us at ago.ca and on Twitter at AGO Toronto. Thank you very much.